space is is basically that someone can rule over another. Someone else has the privilege of determining, of dominating another human being's life. And it makes up the whole system that we're trapped in. The master, the slave, just go on and on and on and on. So I'm overwhelmed as an artist because as an artist, I make so much every year and very rarely have sales. But I do it because it's what my soul is here to do. And so money has, and I am a, a small business owner, and that working with children in my studio is how I feed myself. And I feel wealthy and grateful that I'm, I haven't made any art for the last year. I'm like frozen in what to know, what to do, how to move forward. And I reach out to my indigenous culture, which is very little around here. They're, they're here, not the tribe that I come from, but it's very, it's very challenging because I hear a lot of artists saying, oh, this is time. And I'm like, I don't feel that, you know? And I don't make comfortable art necessarily, but I don't make angry therapeutic art either. So. Um, I guess, sorry, my rambling on the back here. Um, I mean, in terms of sovereignty, I don't think we look enough at this nation, you know? Native peoples have never been given sovereignty. We have been living on the rest since I was born in 1960. Me, as a looking like white person in this culture, I've been on the rest my entire life. So the fact that people are now waking up, that's good, and, you know, I'm. 57, you know, that's a long time to be knowing all this, hearing all this, and now just thinking people are waking up. So um, I think we need to look closer to home, and I, I'm looking forward to looking at this book, um, and I feel very displaced in this town. I didn't used to, but I do now. And there's a woman who's running for Congress that's meeting at our Sagas later today, and I, I've almost, I mean, I've just, I've lost faith in all of the systems. So I don't, and I'm an activist, so to be an active, I know is not what I want to do, but I'm frozen until my integrity will tell me what to do. I can't even, I'm, I'm struggling in the studio, but I know that I can't live unless I eventually get back to work, so I don't know that I've said anything. Okay. But thank you. Uh, Marvin? By any chance, does the author include a definition of subsistence? Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay. After we're done discussing this first part, yeah, uh, I'll give you the definition. Paul, I have a quick observation. I was struck by the emphasis on self reliance and dignity. I can just see these women talking to Hillary and asking about cows. You know, just every day taking care of a cow, feeding it, and then participating in that cow's life, and um, knowing that your survival depends on your efforts, there's this incredible dignity and self-reliance that I see in uh, so-called primitive cultures um, that feels lacking when you go to the grocery store. You know, it, a total different relationship to the earth and to our ancestors. Um, and I think that's the way that the patriarchy breaks little girls and little boys' spirits um, by oftentimes sexual abuse, but breaking their spirits in many ways. You have to act this way or this way or that way or you go bad. But the dignity and self-reliance that children need to get from the adults around them is lacking in this culture. Uh, Art wanted to say something earlier. So you're up. Um, I was going to just say something about the discussion question, actually, not what I was thinking of earlier, uh, in response to that first discussion question, the first bullet point. Um, the, do these poor amendments provide the best perspective? My opinion would be I'd rather replace the best with a valid, a valid perspective. Uh, there are a lot of different perspectives, and to some extent, the problem is we're looking for the best perspective, and maybe there isn't the best perspective. There's just a lot of different perspectives, all of which we need to take into account. My opinion. My um, and then it talks about 
poor women in the global south, which obviously is one valid perspective. I'm saying. We can also break that down a little bit and ask what about poor people in general, whether they're women or whether they're in the global south. And then again, what about just women in general? And what about the global south in general? I think we need to take all those individual perspectives into account whether they are poor women in the global south. I, I would not. Agree so there are lots of different categories here. Yeah. I would agree and they're with all you. they're all helpful. The particular one that I would really like to see more emphasized is just women's point of view. I think that the world would be revolutionized in a very helpful way if uh, there were many more, if women had much more power than they did, politically especially. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, okay, we had Shelly and Ida and Harry. Sherry. 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 Um, I, I was struck, especially when you said what is necessary to control is control over the means of subsistence, including some independent money and income. Um, it, it's a very hard-headed look because they're absolutely dependent on the resources around them, dependent on keeping the water clean, they're dependent on the production of the land, the quality of the soil, so they are in connection with everything around them and working with everything around them. because. They are continually, daily dependent on that, just as we are, only we don't see it, which you mentioned earlier. We, we seem removed from it because we're such a compartmentalized society. But I think about this often like, because our, our economy is totally based on fiat money, which is being traded around the world, and it could just collapse. In an instant, as we saw in 2008, and so if you have any awareness of just how fragile our economy is, you'd be really happy to have a power. I've thought of that. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I just want to say that we're going to take these two comments, and then I'm going to go on because we have a lot more ground to cover today. But there'll be more options for discussion. Uh, I wanted to sing at Lonnie's point, which is to look closer to home. And to point out also that uh, the Lakota women are standing up because of what happened. I think we need to consult with them. I think we need to join them. I would like to see programs here in this town to promote that kind of capacity. Was the Lakota women? The Lakota women, yes. Uh, Phyllis Young, Winona LaDuke. Donald, uh, I can't pronounce Donna's last name, but all the Native elders are saying exactly what Art said, which it is a time for women to stand up and lead, and for men to be in right relationship with us doing that. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you, uh, Sherry. Well, it's just, to me, a, a simple analogy, but the idea of subsistence being the basic needs being met, but also how sustainable is that? And that's what I'm thinking I would like to see more um, emphasis being put on. It can be subsistence, but can it be sustainable? Okay, we're, we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Okay, and first we're going to hit uh, a question about um, a definition of subsistence. And I have a quote here, and this is a definition of subsistence production, but it says subsistence production or production of life includes all work that is expended in the creation, recreation, and maintenance of immediate life and which has no other purpose. Read it again. Subs subsistence production or production of life includes all work that is expended in the creation, recreation, and maintenance of immediate life and which has no other purpose. Can you give an example? Go to the well and get your water. <laughs> right. Dig the well. Um, Dig your well. <clears throat> so, you know, in our society, the transactions that take place often have the purpose of making money. This is in contrast to the idea of making a profit or making money, that what you're trying to do is just make it so that 
everyone in your household, everyone in your family, everyone in your community has the basic things that they need to live. They have water, they have, they have clean water, they have safe, wholesome, nutritious food, they have a shelter that provides them with what they need, that, that the things that you need to keep life going are all taken care of. Um, and other things, you know, and that doesn't mean that there isn't culture or, you know, because there, there is culture, plenty of culture and subsistence uh, societies. So I have a little more of the quote here um, from Maria and Veronica. Subsistence production therefore stands in contrast to commodity and surplus value production. For subsistence production, the aim is life. For commodity production, it is money, which produces ever more money, or the accumulation of capital. And sometimes when I think about this, I reduce it into subsistence produces life, and capitalist patriarchy with its unlimited accumulation produces death, which is what we're seeing with the sixth extinction, what we see with all of the exploitation of so many people in the world. Um, and the violence and wars. Um, so, okay, so many of the people when they think about subsistence think about a hard life, you know, lots of work, living on the margins, not having enough. Um, and that makes many people afraid of subsistence. Uh, it makes it a very feared idea. and. But, you know, a lot of the reason that people in the Global South, poor people, are having a hard time is because they're being exploited and their lands are being taken and their cultures are being destroyed and um, subsistence communities, if they're not being exploited in some way, are many times incredibly abundant, even societies that live in very hard circumstances, like the Bushman people that live in the Kalahari Desert, um, lived as gatherer hunters there and had, you know, perfectly fine and abundant lives. And, uh, you know, the Kalahari is not an easy place to live, but, but they had what they needed. They even, I'm sorry, they just quick one on, on that. Uh, they even mentioned in the book that the Bushmen had a diet or have a diet where they are uh, consuming up to 2,800 um, calories a day, which is considerably rich compared to what we are used to. Yeah, I think that might have been some group other than the Bushmen. I don't think their calorie level was that high, but we, we should check that out because I could be wrong too. But, um, you know, they have very nutritious food and very good lives. And, you know, a lot of people start thinking back into European history and thinking about, you know, how hard it was. But the same thing is true there, you know. Feudal society, um, the people, poor people that were living in, in subsistence were being exploited terribly. And the land was being pressured because there was this power over and um, hierarchy that was going on, uh, so that everything was, lots was being channeled to the top, and so the land would become worn out, and uh, people's lives would become very hard. So, you know, you, you've got to keep clear what subsistence living is, where it doesn't have a foot on top of it, versus what it has when you've got somebody draining, draining it terribly. Okay, so subsistence um, also means having a good life and having power. And power comes from having control over the means of subsistence production. I mean, people that are able to control their own lives and livelihoods uh, by themselves, in their families, and in their communities have are much more empowered than people in our society are. Uh, who ha have to go and work for somebody else, struggle to make ends meet constantly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's 
an interesting paradox, I suppose. Okay, uh, other characteristics of subsistence that Marie and Veronica should talk about, about are having cooperation with nature, the recognition that all the creatures on Earth are relations, uh, being generous, uh, having the ability to do things themselves, that subsistence can mean joy, happiness, abundance, and an ecological way of life. And Maria tells, she tells stories, well they both, they tell stories from their lives um, as part of the book. You know this is kind of an academic book, it's not, it's not an easy read, um, but it's a really good read. But they do tell stories at the beginning of each chapter and, and in some other parts of the book also. And uh, Maria grew up in Germany on a subsistence farm. Her mother um, was a subsistence farm wife um, and she grew up in a large family and looks back you know, at her life on growing up as a really wonderful time in her life. And, she talked about World War II. All of her brothers got conscript, conscripted into Hitler's army. And by the time the war was over, uh, the people in the countryside were feeling incredibly hopeless. But she talks about how much strength and power her mother had. It was, uh, in Germany, it was the woman's job to raise the pigs, and the, their mother had kept the uh, female pig alive during the whole war and other people at the end of the war were so distressed um, that they weren't even planting crops but Maria's mother went and took her female pig to the boar to get piglets and she was able to sell those piglets then later and when they had gotten bigger and buy shoes for all of Maria's brothers that came back from the war. And that's just an example of, you know, a, a woman in a subsistence situation and a really bad subsistence situation having um, a great deal of power. So, people in the industrialized world are extremely dependent on the social and economic system that's very fragile and pushing against the limits of nature. The, Basic necessities of life depend on complex systems that can easily fail, you know, and they're doing that on purpose with their just-in-time uh, stocking of supermarket shelves or shelves at Walmart, you know, a few days and there's no food for your community in an emergency. And we're already having emergencies, Katrina, Puerto Rico, all of it. Um, so because people in the global north lack so much control over the means of our own subsistence, we are really dependent on the capitalist economy uh, to provide for us. And it is not putting the welfare of people, you know, that's not what it cares about. It cares about profit, it does not care about people, and we're living in a very dangerous time. So this dependence that we have on this system is really deadly, as Shelley was just mentioning a little bit ago. Okay, so two really critical elements of subsistence then that we've already talked about, I'm just summarizing here a little bit, are community and individual control over the means of subsistence. And the second one, that the goal is to produce and maintain life. Keeping your eye on the wall, the thing that's the most important. Okay, now, um, I'm sure that probably everyone here has been indoctrinated against subsistence. And if you are listening, to, uh, if, if you are listening to me, but thinking that what I'm saying is unrealistic and undesirable, the chances are that you're feeling strongly a prejudice that is instilled in people in the industrialized world. We're indoctrinated into thinking that modern ways of living are far superior to the ways of so-called primitive peoples or peasants. We're indoctrinated into thinking that we are far superior to so-called primitive peoples or peasants. And uh, a quote here... We're scared into thinking. We're not indoctrinated. We're scared into thinking. Scared. We're scared into thinking it. Not yeah. Yeah, we are. That's a method. 
Right, right. A big piece of me, that's, that's right. So here's another quote from uh, Maria and Veronica. They say, in the North and since 1945, increasingly in the rest of the world, everything that is connected with the immediate creation and maintenance of life, and also everything that is not arranged through the production or consumption of commodities, has been devalued. This includes all activities whose object is self-provisioning, whether in the house, the garden, the workshop, on the land, or in the stable. What doesn't cost or produce money is worthless. This devaluation of self-provisioning work cannot be understood if measured only quantitatively. It indicates at the same time a degradation and contempt for the person who still performs such work. Housework, what drudgery? Agricultural labor, shame. Peasants stink. And she gives an example of this in a book of this farmer who's in the hospital and is being visited by, in Germany, of the farm people in, in his community and of overhearing the um, staff at the hospital talking about how badly the peasants smelled when they came in. So that was very real to Maria about peasants stink. And people's belief that peasants stink. But um, well, they probably do. Well, they probably smell differently than the perfumized people yeah. in the industrialized society, which makes some of us quite ill, actually. So I, I remember being indoctrinated against subsistence by my mother when I was growing up. Um, and some of it was just really simple little things. She would had sayings that she must have picked up in her girlhood. She'd say, you know, if something was going well or I was doing well, now you're cooking with gas. Yep. Better to cook with gas than wood, wood, wood heat. You wouldn't want to just be able to go outside and, you know, get your firewood. you got to buy this gas from somebody. Um, she'd also say, now you're going to town. So, you know, better to go to town. Yeah, yeah. She was drawn, and my mother was drawn, to almost every modern improvement that came along. Um, but she did occasionally resist new technologies, like she had been worked as a secretary for 10 or 15 years before I was born, and um, she was a very accomplished typist, but she w wouldn't, couldn't switch to an electric typewriter. Years, you know, when I graduated from high school, the gift that she and my mother and my father gave me was an electric typewriter. And when I started using a computer, I gave them the electric typewriter, but neither one of them could use it. You know, they had this old manual typewriter, and they were both good typists. My dad was too. They just back away on that thing. Um, and my mother was born at home at her grandparents' farm in rural Missouri near Warrensburg. But some of her cousins still live on that property. You know, they're 85 or 90 by now. Uh, maybe they're older than that because my mother would have been 100 if she was still alive or something. Um, but my mother, you know, looked down on those cousins that were still out there um, on the farm, even though, you know, they had jobs in town too. But So, you know, if you look back at your childhood, you may, or the rest of your life, you may be able to come up with lots of examples where, you know, you had subtle pressures about how bad it is. So here's another little quote from uh, Murray and Veronica. So they say, how did this alienation between people and their work develop to the point that the most lifeless thing of all money is seen as the source of life, and our own life-producing subsistence work is seen as the source of death? And so, you know, that brings up the question, why, why are we being indoctrinated against subsistence? You know, what's the point? And uh, Maria and Veronica say, Ivan Illich stated as long ago as 1982 that the war against subsistence is the real war of capital, not the struggle against unions and their wage demands. Only after people's capacity to subsist is destroyed are they totally and unconditionally in the power of capital? What book is that from? Uh, it's from this book. It's where Maria. It's a quote. It's a quote from Maria and Veronica. Uh, no. Uh, okay. They, Ivan they, Illich. Oh, the Ivan Illich. I don't know. She's got. What was his book? Look at the bibliography. I don't know. We have. 
Trump we have to look in the bibliography mm -hmm. for that. Uh, this, I mean, this book is footnoted in there. Yeah. I mean, these, these are these women are scholars. He's, he's very famous yeah. Guy, but I can't find yeah. So, and it's really clear if you look at what's going on in the global south and to indigenous peoples all over the world that a war is being carried out vigorously against the people there. You know, they're stealing land constantly. Um, but if the corporations that are setting up shop in somewhere outside the industrialized world need workers, then they uh, need to break the self-sufficiency of the peasant communities. Otherwise, why would they go and you know work for the corporations? And so they do that. And um, there's a good. Uh, discussion in, in the book about the uh, what's gone on over the last you know, 30, 40, 50 years in Guatemala um, of where they need indigenous, the indigenous people though, Mayan peoples, peasant peoples, to come and do agricultural work on the plantations for part of the year. So they force them down there to work off of their land. And when, but then if the peasant people there become too rebellious. They've gone, gone in in the past and just cleared out an entire mountainside, just wiped everyone out, shoved them out to, to break their rebellion and their subsistence. It's, it's very incredible the things that have gone on there. But that's just one example you know, of what's going on so many places all over the world. And um, the authors of the book talk some about what happened in Germany uh, after World War II to bring an end to subsistence farming. And you know, they didn't go in with guns in Germany. Instead, uh, they just shifted, you know, made legislation and shifted policies to favor large farms and forced small farmers mm -hmm. to sell their lands because they couldn't make it any.